I have loved insects since I was a kid. Um, always found them fascinating. I don't know, I collected all, I also have kind of an obsession with collections and the act of collecting and people who collect. I think it's a really fascinating thing that humans do. Um, and to kind of rein myself in from being a hoarder, somehow I found this hobby that allows me to collect very small things that I really love. That, um, so yeah, about four years ago, I thought it was an interesting idea. I thought I'd try it, I bought a little kit and uh, kind of started something in me that has not stopped. It's just continued to snowball. Um, so what I'm gonna show you is a bit of my collection. I have probably about two thirds of my collection here. Uh, there's a lot more at home, um, but I brought in some very special things, uh, some current things, and then mostly what I was trying to show is kind of the process and the tools involved. Um, there's a lot of gear you can really get into. A lot of it is custom made because there's not a lot of companies making things for this kind of things, or at least not making things that tools that I like. I, I've kind of modified things or produced things exactly how I think they should be designed. Um, so yeah, uh, just to talk through the process, I'll go kind of step by step. So first there's the act of collecting, and this is a really fun part of the hobby. It can get a little bit obsessive because you can collect more than you can actually get pinned. That process is very labor intensive. This process takes about two seconds and is super instant gratification. That like thwack you get in your net when you catch something is very fun. It's, I'm sure people who hunt totally get it, or at least I get people who hunt now. I've never hunted, but I see it. You're out in nature, you're kind of like being quiet and, and paying attention to, to the natural world and then you get to keep something from it. It's pretty cool. So some of the gear I have with that, I have a lot of nets. Um, there are a lot of different kinds of nets. There are nets for collecting aquatic things, nets for, this one is specifically a Lepidoptera net. So it's made of a more fine mesh material um, that won't damage the wings of butterflies and, and moths, which are Lepidoptera. Um, this one is not a sweeper net. I, there's a technique in which you go out in a field and just like basically beat bushes with their net and see what you get. Um, I kind of use this for this because it's a pretty rough and rugged material. This is actually the first net I ever owned. Um, I have just a little pocket net. Um, it's just really teeny. The, all of these nets actually collapse and all the segments fold up and I can fit two nets and about uh, eight feet of extensions in my bag and carry it out with me. Um, when you're out there and once you catch something, you have to store the specimen. First, you have to expire the specimen. So uh, the, there's a couple of ways you can do that, but basically all of them involve a chemical called ethyl acetate. Um, one of the ways in which you do that is use a kill jar. So these jars have a small amount of um, uh, plaster that absorb the chemical and kind of create a little gas chamber. And it's actually a really cool chemical because they just kind of go to sleep at first. You can actually put them to sleep, take them out, they'll come back to life and fly away. Um, but if you leave them in there for like 10 or 15 minutes, they eventually just die. So it, it allows you to do a few things. You can like put them all to sleep and sort. Uh, sometimes if it's a really large specimen, I'll just actually inject them. So I keep a small um, syringe on me and some ethyl acetate in a little vial. And for large things, you just um, Other tools involved, an aspirator is sometimes used for small things. So this is like a little jar and you suck and it sucks them into the chamber. Um, this little screen to keep you from sucking up gross stuff. Um, that's used especially for night collecting, which I can talk about. Night collecting is used, and at, it's probably one of my favorite things to do. Uh, it's for moths, so moths are nocturnal. There are, the ratio of species diversity of moths to butterflies is incredible. There's actually 16 times more kinds of moths than there are butterflies, and we rarely ever see them because they're at night and only during like a month of the year or possibly a week of the year sometimes. So if you go out at night and you hang a black light or any kind of light that emits a look, like a UV frequency, um, it will attract moths and I'll hang a big sheet. Um, I have like a bunch of a little kit of equipment for doing that. I have a battery um, and then it just attracts in moths and then I'm collecting them. It's actually a really fun thing to do. A little night light. Um, yeah, my bag is, uh, oh yeah, that's the other thing. So once you collect a specimen, you have to store it temporarily. We use glassine envelopes. It's kind of the standard. Um, there's a few different sizes and shapes that you can use, but you basically label, mark like the location, the GPS coordinates. I take a screenshot of my phone, give it a little number, and then mark that on here. 
stored away. That way I'm just keeping track of what everything is. Um, after it's collected, then we're kind of moving into the second stage, which is a form of temporary storage. Um, insect specimens, once they are in a glass and envelope, can last for 50 years, as long as they're kept in a cool, dry place and, and uh, stored away. So I have examples of that. These are actually like full of insect specimens that I just have not gotten to in terms of pinning. Some of them I've collected, some of them I've gotten through trades. Um, here's an example of one I bought on eBay. This is actually one of the larger moths in the world, at least in terms of wingspan. This is a white witch moth. Um, but this came in an envelope like this, and I have lots of other. These are from a collector in Japan. These are Papuleo Mackie, um, who I traded with on Instagram. I, I know a lot of people on Instagram through an insect trade. Beetles are usually stored like this on little cardboard plates and then wrapped in plastic for long-term storage. Um, and actually, you know what? While I'm doing this, I was, I'm going to pass this around because one of the most fun things about this hobby is actually just getting to see an insect up close, which you never get to do when they're buzzing around your face and you think they're going to kill you. So I'm just going to pass this around. I've seen butterflies go for $7,000 on eBay, like very rare specimens. The quality of them has to be just so. Yeah, there's, there's wackos out there who are far more obsessed than me, believe me. So there, yeah. There's a grading system. Um, yeah, so uh, if a specimen is dried, you can reanimate it to pin it. It's actually a very simple process to go from a very old dried insect to a beautifully spread insect. You basically get it moist. So we have a, a relaxing chamber, which is just a moist box. These are actually some specimens that I caught in Oregon recently, and they're all kind of in a bath of warm air right now. And a chemical called chlorocresol which keeps mold down and keeps them preserved. Um, and then I can pin them. Uh, I have created my own pinning surfaces. This, commonly, it's usually just like a wood spreading board for butterflies to spread their wings out. Um, but I prefer foam surface. You can get the pins further in. It, it's a lot nicer. Um, I've also created a, like a grid on top for symmetry so I can kind of align things. Um, I, when I'm out in the field, like if I'm not pinning at home. I have a, a pinning box that I can just stuff in a backpack. So this is made of a unbreakable material, apparently. That's what I was told, and I built a f uh, some foam inside. And so this is, these are actually all specimens that I collected recently on a vacation in Oregon. So I could be out with my family, hiking, catch something, come home, and just quickly pin them up, so, which is pretty cool. There's a lot of tools involved in doing so. When you're spreading out a butterfly, typically you are uh, spreading its wings and then ho holding the wings down with a special type of glassine paper strips. So you're cutting those and then pinning those to kind of hold the wings in place, make sure they dry flat. Um, lots of different kinds of little tweezers and things. This is some tweezers I kind of modified to hold very delicate small objects like an antenna, if I have to glue on an antenna. These are uh, meant just for picking up pins. Um, for actually touching the wings of Lepidoptera, you kind of have a very flat, rounded surface. Um, pins, pins come in a lot of different sizes, depending on what I'm doing. I might have very thin pins or very thick, sturdy ones. Uh, there's a few different chemicals. There's some uh, chemical ammonia hydroxide will help relax an insect's legs sometimes if they're really stiff. Um, let's see, this is just isopropyl alcohol. Um, insect glue, there's glue, there's several different kinds of uh, actual insect glue marketed and sold just for that. Really, really, really tiny pins. If you get a chance to come look at these, there's like some microscopic pins used for really th small things. Um, and then I use these boards that uh, are just useful for like while I'm working, pinning things in and out. So keeping track of labels. And so that's the, that's the second stage or I guess third stage, where uh, you are preparing the specimens. And then the last one is storage. So storing the specimens, there's a lot of different kinds of boxes. There's very expensive um, uh, entomology cabinets. I mean, you can spend $2,000 for a, something like this big, filled with drawers. I've never done that. So I, I kind of have a cheap solution of, of these storage bins um, that I keep uh, desiccant inside to keep make sure it's dry. Um, 
and then there's an insecticide in here and they're kept out of the light. That, that's the biggest thing to keep these things from the color looking really good long term is keeping them out of UV light. Um, so I only actually have so many, this case here I actually keep on my wall that I just really love because I'd like to be able to look at them. But most of my specimens, all of these, I, they're completely in the dark. Um, this case I brought in, because this is, I've been just kind of filling this one out. This is an, uh, just stuff I've caught this summer. And most of it's uh, from Wisconsin. A lot of these specimens I did not catch. Some of the larger ones in here, they're from buying or trading. But th these are all specimens I have personally gathered. And uh, a lot of them are from Wisconsin. These, these are some of the giant silk moths that you probably would never actually see, but they're, all, all of these specimens are from, well, these two are from northern Wisconsin. This one's from uh, maybe 30 miles east of here. Uh, yeah, so that's pretty cool. And then uh, I have some stored. These specimens, though, are actually really special. Uh, I brought them in because I, I, I think everybody should see them. So. Uh, these are some antique specimens I got from somebody who found them in an estate sale. It was, I drove down to Indiana to get them. And we, nobody really knows, apparently a Notre Dame professor originally owned them, but I don't actually know if that's true. I can't find any information on them. But these are all beetles that were collected, and this is only half the collection, uh, by very, a lot of very famous ent entomologists I have found names of. So I, I have a, fairly good community on Instagram, and I've been posting photos of, of labels and stuff, and I've had actual entomologists who manage museum collections chime in to say, that guy is this, and he was here. There's like forests in Brazil named after uh, one guy who maybe a third of these beetles were collected by. Um, so there's some really cool, especially the tortoise beetles are really weird. I encourage you to come up and look at these clo up close. They're very strange. Most of them are from South America. There's things in here from India. You can't a lot of these places you can't collect anymore. India you especially can't collect in. Brazil is very hard to collect in. Um, and then these are very special because these are Denton Brothers specimens. So I actually have a little catalog by the Denton Brothers printed in 1900. Uh, these specimens, the Denton Brothers, they were American brothers who lived around the turn of the century, kind of right at the end of the Victorian era when the hype of, of kind of having a cabinet of curiosities or like a natural history collection was at its highest. They basically pioneered the idea of taking a butterfly, framing it and selling it as art, which is something that we all think of, but they were the first to really do that. And they like had special framing techniques that they patented. And this is a catalog where you can buy these kinds of frames and other materials. So these specimens are all 120 years old. They're super old and, and you can kind of see it in them. A lot of them were not in great condition when I got them, but I don't really care because I, even if they kind of half destroyed, they just represent an interesting part of history. As far as I know and what the guy I acquired them from told me is that it's the largest collection, personal collection of their specimens. Um, there is a museum um, some, in some small town on the East Coast, I need to look that up again, where the Denton brothers uh, donated a large amount of their specimens to at the end of their life. So you can go and see them there, I would like to someday, but these are pretty cool. This hobby was kind of at its heyday in like the 50s, if you were rich and had time. You could go anywhere, collect anything, bring it back. You can get a, a um, license to bring in, spec to import specimens. It's expensive, uh, but a lot of it has to do with other countries, really. They, there's a lot of, like I can't go down to Mexico. Mexico's almost impossible to collect in, but there, a lot of European countries are fine. Japan, I would really love to go, is fine. French guana, which is owned by France, I can go and collect, and that's in the Amazonian region. Um, yeah, so there's, there's, there's places. It's just you can't just go anywhere. You can. It happens. If you go on eBay and look up some of these specimens, there are ones that are sites-protected species, like that one I told you sold for $7,000. That was totally animal trafficking and, and probably shouldn't happen, but they, I don't know if anyone's really paying attention to a lot of this, like, small trade. You know, it's going through the mail. So, I don't know. I think it's getting harder and harder to do this and import things, but it's kind of a slow process. I'm hoping to get out in the world and do some of this outside of the country before it gets too tough. If they're cared for in a museum setting um, where, I, I've actually visited the, the entomology collection at the Field Museum, which is one of the, lar it's the second largest in the States, and everything's just in like these perfectly sealed boxes. 
the whole room smells like mothballs because they're trying to keep any kind of anything that could eat the specimens, which is always a problem, um, out of there. Uh, they will last for hundreds of years, like basically in, indefinitely, as long as they're cared for well. So, and I'm, that's kind of one of the fun things about it. I'm hoping that someday when I die, my specimens will be cared for well enough that they can be donated to museum, and then my name will be on a bunch of stuff too that somebody can look up someday. So. Yeah. You also like when I'm out in the field? No, after you. Yeah, if you have any interest, you can follow me on Instagram. It's basically my entire Instagram. That's all I do. Is it's just turned into my entomology collection or a documentation of this hobby. So there's what's some good your, shots in there. What's your process for identifying what this I'm uh, my process is terrible. I basically have none. I, it's not as critical that I ID all of them. It's very critical that I know where it was found and when it was found. Someone can ID it later, that's better. It's the actual process of IDing insects is, is more complicated than you might think. Quite often, in order for an entomologist to really ID something, they're like cutting out their genitals and looking at them under a microscope in order to really know what they're looking at because it, some of them are easy. Like a monarch is a monarch, most people know that, but you get into some of these moths that all look the same, it's, but truly their species are different. It's just very hard to tell. The di diversity is, until you get into this, you don't realize how epic, how the, the scale of the diversity is so crazy. Um, it's not like any other kind of uh, animal that we can think of in terms of the speciation diversity. It's, it's pretty crazy. How, like there's stuff being discovered all the time. I talked to an entomologist down at the UW last year who uh, found three new kinds of mosquitoes just around in this area, just like, just like that. New, new, new period. New period. Uh, outside the Field Museum, there was a new kind of fly discovered. That's in the middle of Chicago. So it's, it's, it may look like, but if you actually dig into the behavior and um, details in their morphology, which is like the genitals, like the shape of the genitals, there's actually differences that prevent them from breeding. So the diversity is crazy. It's, it's kind of, it's an amazing, amazing world. So. Yeah, monarchs are the only, only species that I know of that make like a really large migration. I don't, I've never heard of any moths that migrate. Moths have a, a, a lot of moths have a fairly short lifespan. They're not feeding as much. Their, their adult stage really is just to breed. Especially these giant silk moths that are here. Like these guys don't even have mouths. Their mouth parts are undeveloped and tiny and they, they can't feed at all. They live about two weeks at, at the most. So their whole job is to have sex. Mm. And then die. That, that, I mean, most of their lives are spent as a larva. And actually, I have some polyphemus caterpillars in here. I'm going to be keeping them on my desk. So that's, that's this guy right here. So in maybe three weeks or so, we'll have some caterpillars. I was thinking maybe once they're moths, I'll just like not tell Dave Franchino and put them in his office. <laughs> see, see how long it takes him to differentiate those between all his, uh, his cranes. <laughs> I'm pretty obsessed with moths. I think they're so fascinating because you, you don't ever see them. I mean, we think we see them, but you have no idea. Until you get out there with a black light, you have no idea how crazy it is. Uh, this, actually, the White Witch is one of my favorites. This, so, I, I wish, I'm actually really upset about this specimen because it, it didn't come with collection data, which is now I know why it was so cheap uh, when I bought it. But uh, these are really special. They live in South America. Nobody has ever seen the uh, larva of them or a male. So it, there's actually like a bounty for entomologists. There's a, like a group of entomologists trying to basically create motivation for people to try and go out and find these things because they come to lights, but nobody's, nobody knows what they feed on. They're like a total mystery, um, which is pretty cool. And they're just huge and beautiful. Um, there's a cousin of it of sorts. I think, I don't know if it's in the same, I know it's in the same family. I don't know if it's in the same genus, but uh, the black witch moth here, which was actually given to me by a client um, at his, it came from his house in Hawaii. So, but that, that's related, which is kind of interesting. These two stripe walking sticks here came from a very specific park in Florida. Um, I guess that's really it. I've collected down in Arizona where my family is. I, I haven't like traveled internationally to do this yet. I'm still a little intimidated by that because it's, it's, uh, oh, I got to make sure I do it legally. I don't want to go to jail. <laughs> so, yeah. 
Spiders, because they, they are actually soft-bodied, um, they don't have an exoskeleton the same way insects do. So if you try and dry them out, they typically shrivel up. Uh, there, are ex there are examples like um, uh, tarantulas do pretty well, but most of those are kept in alcohol. So I actually, I keep some vials of alcohol for other interesting things, usually when I'm collecting, and I can drop them in there, like if it's a really cool spider. So there are wet specimen collections as well, though I don't really have a lot of that. Yeah, any other questions? Yeah. yeah.